this <laughs> a lie detector test would be just I, I would be fine with that. I got nightmares in my head. I fear thoughts build up until I can't feel. My mind fills up into a creature, and it haunts me somewhere much deeper. I got nightmares in my head. I fear the thoughts build up until I can't hear. That my mind fills up into a creature, and it haunts me somewhere much deeper. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Did you know that Amanda Knox fancied one of the boys downstairs, but Giacomo Silenzi liked Meredith instead? Have you ever heard Amanda Knox admit to that? Now, this is a question for all the girls out there. If it were up to you, who would be your first choice? Did she Giacomo or... Nerdy Raffaele. Now, we could dig into this further, a lot further, but Solicitor in his own book admits he was very inexperienced and that Knox was only his second girlfriend. Amanda Knox also admits that she went to Italy as a quite a naive 20-year-old. Now, compare that to Meredith and Giacomo. Were they, were they both inexperienced? Were they both naive? Were they as naive and inexperienced as Amanda Knox and Raffaele Solicitor. Now, Meredith was actually worried that Giacomo, who played in a band, was a bit of a player. He would be nice to her at home, whereas if he saw her in the street, it was almost as though he barely knew her, and this concerned her. Besides arriving in Perugia with a prestigious Erasmus scholarship, Meredith had also appeared in a music video in the UK, not just appeared, but she was basically the focus of the video, and this was just weeks before her death. Meredith was also a year and a half older than Amanda, which, when you're in your first year at university, is a huge gulf of time and often life experience. So, on paper, who had a higher social status? Who had greater agency? Whatever the answer, Giacomo chose Meredith. Now, all of this is basically a reminder of simmering tensions between Knox and Meredith. And if you think love triangles are harmless, the Caitlin Armstrong case is a prescient example of just how destructive a love triangle can be when one woman feels threatened by another. In any event, in this part of the email, Knox takes us through the first of two visits to the murder scene. You'll notice in Knox's telling of the events how Meredith is not only silent, but almost excised completely out of the story, even though Meredith was clearly home on the weekend of her death. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Bear in mind, in this video, what is kind of in the going on in the background, the um, footage that you're seeing while I'm narrating is actual crime scene footage. Amanda Knox has given several speeches and asked money for them, talking about the events. Does anybody know whether she's ever referred to this footage? Has she ever shown this footage as a way to explain what has happened? Or has she not done so? If you're seeing this footage for the first time, if you find it worthwhile, interesting, you're learning something, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So this is the next part of her email. She writes, So I arrived home and the first abnormal thing I noticed was the door was wide open. Here's the thing about the door to our house. It's broken in such a way that you have to use the keys to keep it closed. If we don't have the door locked, it is really easy for the wind to blow the door open. And so my roommates and I always have the door locked unless we are running really quickly to bring the garbage out or to get something from the neighbors who live below us. Notice the incredible amount of detail Knox volunteers in her narrative here. No trouble with amnesia here. She goes on to write, Another important piece of information for those who don't know, I inhabit, quite a strange word that, have you ever said, I inhabit somewhere? 
I inhabit a house of two stories, of which my three roommates and I share the second story apartment. There are four Italian guys of our age, between 22 and 26, who live below us. We were all quite good friends and we talk often. Giacomo is especially welcome because he plays guitar with me and Laura, one of my roommates, and is or was dating Meredith. Now, Laura is actually the owner of the guitar, and Knox didn't actually bring a guitar with her to Italy. She, she, she saw that Laura had a guitar, asked Laura if she could borrow it, and that is really how that sort of came about. So Knox is really just starting to learn how to play guitar when all of this happens. The other thing that's interesting is that Knox feels Giacomo's relationship status is important enough to mention, along with the fact that they had an interest in music in common. She goes on to write, the other three are Marco, Stefano and Ricardo. Anyway, so the door was wide open. Strange, yes, but not so strange that I really thought anything about it. Now, how would you feel if you arrived home and the door to your home was wide open and there was apparently no one inside? She goes on to write, I assume someone in the house was doing exactly what I just said, taking out the trash or talking really quickly to the neighbors downstairs. Knox actually didn't need to assume anything. On her way to her own room, she'd pass Meredith's room and Meredith could confirm what was going on. After all, she was staying there that weekend. And if she wasn't there, Knox could call Meredith and say, hey, do you know what's going on? Here Knox also suggests that the neighbors were downstairs when no one was in the villa besides herself and Meredith. A quick look at the setup of the villa shows it's a separate building with no houses next door, which means you'd immediately know who was home simply by noticing the presence of the vehicles or indeed the absence of vehicles in the driveway. Now, in terms of the Italian boys downstairs or the Italian girls upstairs, no cars would mean that no one was home. Knox goes on to write, So I closed the door behind me, but I didn't lock it, assuming that the person who left the door open would like to come back in. Well, there she goes, assuming again. The best person to confirm what was going on with the door would be Meredith. Does Knox do that? Now, in hindsight, the thing that should have alarmed Knox should have been Meredith's closed door and Meredith's kind of mute silence. Instead, she draws our attention to another door and also basically testifies that Meredith often closed and locked her door. And that was something Philomena said wasn't true. And this is going to the instance where she said that. Romanelli claimed that Meredith rarely closed and locked her own bedroom door, while Knox claimed Meredith regularly locked her door even to take a shower. Well, who do you believe? Going back to her email, she writes, When I entered, I called out if anyone was there, but no one responded, and I assumed that if anyone was there, they were still asleep. Laura's door was open, which meant she wasn't home, and Philomena's door was also closed. My door was open like always, and Meredith's door was closed, which to me meant she was sleeping. I undressed in my room and took a quick shower in one of the two bathrooms in my house, the one that is right next to Meredith, and my bedrooms, situated right next to each other. Again, think about the level of detail in that statement. I undressed in my room and had a quick shower. Why is it important to disclose this? She goes on to write, It was after I stepped out of the shower and onto the mat that I noticed the blood in the bathroom. It was on the mat I was using to dry my feet, and there were drops of blood in the sink. So let me ask you a question. If you went to shower in a small bathroom, do you think you'd miss this mat? It's extremely likely that the killer left this footprint in Meredith's blood, but why is the killer barefooted and in the bathroom? The prosecution believed the bare footprint to be a match not of Knox's foot or of Rudy Gade's, but Raffaele Solicito. Remember, besides Knox herself, he was also found guilty twice and acquitted twice. What does Knox have to say about this? According to her email, she says, At first I thought the blood might have come from my ears, which I had pierced extensively not too long ago. But then immediately I know it wasn't mine because the stains on the mat were too big for just droplets from my ear. Now, again, Knox provides incredible detail here. 
but she leaves out the most obvious detail, that the blood on the mat is quite obviously in the shape of a footprint. Also, I think it's clear that there is no way that you would pierce your ears and leave such a pool of blood that you could leave a footprint uh, with that blood. You know, if you think about the explanation that she thought it might come from her ears, it just doesn't wash whatsoever. And I think the same also applies to um, someone going through, you know, that time of the month kind of thing. You wouldn't expect someone to step into it and onto a mat and for there to be so much blood. Anyway, she goes on to write, When I touched the blood in the sink, it was caked on already. She's basically saying it was dried. There was also blood smeared on the faucet. Again, however, I thought it was strange because my roommates and I are very clean and we wouldn't leave blood in the bathroom. But I assumed that perhaps Meredith was having menstrual issues and hadn't cleaned up yet. Ew, but nothing to worry about. In her email, Knox admits a crucial detail that she touched the blood in the sink, Meredith's blood. In court, prosecutors would say that Knox's DNA was found mixed with Meredith's blood and the prosecution described this as irrefutable inculpatory evidence. In fact, Knox's blood was found in the bathroom and there were also Kircher and Knox mixtures in Philomena's room as well. Now, in my books on this case, I have speculated that if Knox was injured to the extent that she was bleeding, where could this injury have uh, occurred if it's not an ear piercing, ear, ear piercing scenario? Now, you would also think at this point certainty ought to be increasing that someone had gotten into the house and yet still knocks in the bathroom, doesn't make any effort to communicate with Meredith in, in her own story. I also seem to remember reading about Knox being admonished by her roommates for not flushing, as well as for keeping a vibrator in the bathroom, amongst other things. I started feeling a little uncomfortable, and so I grabbed the mop from our closet and left the house, closing and locking the door that no one had come back through while I was in the shower, and I returned to Raphael's place. She implies feeling unsafe in the house, but none of that concern extends to Meredith. If she felt unsafe, would Meredith be safe? Was Meredith safe? Nothing about, I wonder where she is, I wonder how she is. The, all of those thoughts would be normal and natural, and yet they don't occur to Knox. She goes on to write, After we had used the mop to clean up the kitchen, I told Raffaele about what I had seen in the house over breakfast the strange blood in the bathroom, the door wide open, the shit left in the toilet. He suggested I call one of my roommates, so I called Philomena. So why does she elect to call Philomena and not Meredith? And it's also interesting that Rafael has got to make a suggestion. Why, why not call Meredith? They know Meredith is in town. They know that she was the only one home over the weekend besides Knox. Remember, Meredith's got nowhere else to go. She's an expat, and the, the villa is her home, and all the Italians have got somewhere else to go. You know, they have family in Italy. So, Meredith's home, why not call Meredith? Knox writes, Philomena had been at a party the night before with her boyfriend Marco. Not the same Marco who lives downstairs, but we'll call him Marco F, as in Philomena, and the other can be Marco N, as in neighbor. Again, incredible amount of detail in this particular um, narrative. She goes on to write, She also told me that Laura wasn't at home and hadn't been because she was on business in Rome, which meant the only one who had spent the night at her house last night was Meredith, and she was as of yet unaccounted for. Interesting neutral language here, unaccounted for. The other thing that's also interesting is you've got Philomena having to tell Knox that the logical person to call here is Meredith, right? You've got Philomena saying, Amanda, you need to communicate with Meredith. She's there. Ask her what's going on. Find out, also find out if she's safe. Because none of this apparently occurs to Knox herself. Knox writes, Philomena seemed really worried, so I told her I'd call Meredith and then call her back. I called both of Meredith's phones, the English one first and last, and the Italian one between. Again, observe the incredible, incredible amount of crystal clear detail in this narrative compared to the confused, foggy, 
I don't know whether this is a dream or, or not amnesia of the four-page note. Knox goes on to write, The first time I called the English phone, it rang and then sounded as if there was a disturbance, but no one answered. I then called the Italian phone and it just kept ringing, no answer. I called her English phone again and this time an English voice told me her phone was out of service. Raffaele and I gathered our things and went back to my house. So what I don't understand, if Knox was genuinely traumatized and genuinely couldn't remember what happened, why not just refer to the, the, the cops to this email? This is her statement. Why not just say, there it is, it's all the detail, this is what I know happened, what I can remember. And why is so much of the four-page note inconsistent with this in-depth email? They, they, they're very, very different. Also, what does Knox mean by, I called the English phone, it rang and then sounded as if there was a disturbance? What does that mean? She goes on to write, I unlocked the door and I'm going to tell this really slowly to get everything right, so just have patience with me. Now, I'm not going to take it further than that. Uh, we'll deal with the second investigation of the crime scene by the suspects in part four. But I want to conclude by reminding you of another relevant detail. Why is it Knox and Celesto both turned off their phones on October 31st, the night before the murder? Celesto from 8.42 p.m. until 6.52 a.m. And Knox only activated her phone at 12.07 at almost noon on November 1st. Had this happened before, did they have a habit of turning their phones off? What do you think? Also, is the correct way to interpret this that the couple were blissfully cocooned together, or the opposite, that they were bickering, that Raffaele was working on his thesis and he needed a little bit of space from Amanda? You know, he couldn't work on his thesis while she was watching the MTV Awards. And so if they were bickering, did they turn off their phones to block one another? Have you ever done that? Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.